Good afternoon and, and welcome to uh, the final panel of the day. Um, everyone, it's been a, a practice today to, to thank Michael uh, for the invitation and so on, but, but I already live and work here, so. Um, and, and we're really having a glorious fall afternoon outside, so I'm not sure I should thank Michael for, for the invitation, other than, than uh, uh, I should thank him for drawing together uh, such a, a great collection of speakers and commentators uh, today. Uh, and uh, this has really been, been a great conference, but we, we expect as much from Michael, so um, a good show, and, and thanks for doing it again, and, and thanks for letting me be a, a part of it. Uh, this panel is going to be a moderated discussion, so hopefully you'll hear relatively little of me, uh, about the question of, of lawfare and its relevance to the war on terror. Um, and we have with us uh, four individuals who will provide various perspectives on that. I'm going to very briefly summarize their bios. Their full bios are in the booklet, but I think it's better to spend more of our time on the substance at hand. Um, and uh, you can read their, their full and impressive bios at your leisure. Uh, but just very briefly, uh, David Fracht is professor of law at Barry University, uh, Duane Andreas School of Law. Uh, he's also a Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Air Force Judge Advocate General Corps Reserve, and most significantly for our panel, uh, took leave from teaching to serve as lead defense counsel uh, for two Guantanamo detainees, and in July 2009, became the first defense counsel to win the dismissal of military commission charges that had been referred to trial and to win the release through habeas corpus of a detainee that faced war crimes charges. Uh, to his left, uh, is Melissa Waters, who is professor of law at Washington University in St. Louis School of Law. Uh, among her many accomplishments, she was previously a, a visiting professor here at Case Western, so of course we have to mention that. She'll be upset if I don't mention she's a, a, a proud native of Arkansas, uh, and has al was also a senior advisor to uh, Harold Coe when he was Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Uh, to my left, uh, is Sandy Hodgkinson, who is Special Assistant to the Deputy Secretary of Defense in the Department of Defense, and who previously served, uh, in, among other positions, as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Aff Affairs, and as uh, Deputy to the Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues at the State Department. Uh, I should note that she is here in her personal capacity, so any views she expresses are her own, uh, and should not be attributed to the Department of Defense uh, or, or the Administration. Uh, and to her left is uh, Michael Leibovitz, who is a prosecutor with the Office of Military Commissions. We are proud to welcome him back as one of our alums. Um, and uh, he has uh, uh, participated in numerous uh, military defense cases as both a private attorney and as a judge advocate in the Virginia Army National Guard uh, before uh, uh, assuming his current uh, position as a prosecutor. Uh, now, in terms of our, our topic, we've been discussing all day this issue of lawfare and what it means uh, and whether it has relevance to the war on terror, or sorry, whether it has relevance in, in academic discussions about uh, warfare uh, and national security, and, and our specific panel is focused on the question of its relevance uh, to the war on terror. And certainly there are many folks that do think uh, it is quite relevant. Uh, a, a, a columnist uh, writing about the uh, Lawfare Project conference that occurred this past spring uh, wrote that uh, federal courts are slowly becoming a new battlefield in the war on terror with combatants setting aside traditional weapons and arming themselves instead with domestic and international laws. Uh, just last week, uh, I'm sure in anticipation of this conference, uh, the Wall Street Journal e editorialized, uh, however well our troops do on the battlefield, a reality of modern times is that the U.S. can still lose the war on terror in the courtroom. Uh, so as an initial matter, uh, the, que the first question I would throw out to our panelists uh, is whether uh, lawfare, uh, and, and I'm assuming we're defining it as, as the alleged use of law as a substitute for military or other means of achieving an operational objective, is this a real concern uh, in the war on terror? Is this something that uh, either as, as uh, individuals engaged in, in this conflict or as attorneys or in some other capacity, something that should uh, concern us, uh, and, and is it a trend that, that is at all worrisome? And who wants to, s David? I'm happy to jump in. I, I think that it is a fabricated concern. Um, I believe that m some uh, neoconservatives did believe it was a real concern, but that their uh, fears were, were exaggerated. Um, 
but maybe not, because what they really feared was that the actions of the Bush administration would be subject to review uh, and scrutiny by the courts, and such review and scrutiny does, did not make the Bush administration look particularly good. Um, but the idea that, that we had to fear that al-Qaeda would use the courts, um, I think, was, was really not founded, not well-founded. Uh, for one thing, just to give you an example, I had, I represented a guy named Ali Hamza al-Balul, who was the uh, propaganda minister, uh, if you will, for al-Qaeda, and he was a personal secretary to Osama bin Laden, very proud of that fact. Uh, every time he went in the courtroom, he professed his undying allegiance to al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. Um, so if anyone were gonna use lawfare, this would be the guy, but what he said was, you know, I don't, rec I don't recognize your law, Western law, international law, I only recognize Sharia and, you know, uh, the will of Allah. So um, I, I just didn't get the sense from him that he really, now he was perfectly happy to embarrass the United States, uh, in, you know, when he ever had the opportunity as a means of continuing the, the war while in captivity. But I, I just don't think we have, we really have to, what do we have to fear? The only thing we have to fear is if we are actually violating the laws of war. So if, if we're actually torturing people, then yes, we should be worried. Um, but if, if we're not, and we can document that, that our treatment is humane and that we're doing things by the book, then uh, we really shouldn't, shouldn't have, it, have to worry. Let me Please. try a, a slightly different way of answering the same question. And, and I would say yes, that lawfare is a real concern in the war on terror, but I would look at it in different ways. I mean, when I'm defining lawfare, I'm sticking to a much more narrow definition. Um, and rather than repeat all the people from today I do agree with, um, I'm looking at it again as a weapon of the enemy in engaging us, you know, using military objective, this lawfare in lieu of a traditional military objective. And so I wouldn't consider access to the court system, frankly, to be part of that lawfare. I mean, that the court systems will operate, and they have operated, and they've provided great guidance as to, you know, the way forward in a number of ways. Uh, when I look at the way that lawfare is being used in the war on terror, I think of it much more in the way that al-Qaeda has engaged the conduct of their actual operations. And in a few critical ways that have been reflected, I think, earlier today, and then I'll expand on a little bit now, um, one of those is clearly through the media, and it's clearly been through use of claims, some of which may well have been true but exaggerated, or other claims that may have been excessive or not true, um, but that have been used um, to discredit the conduct of the American military and other forces. Um, and a lot of that has been done through the use of media and propaganda, through the use of video cameras that show an image that they believe they're portraying, but it may not actually be the facts as they occurred. Um, and so I think that that is part of what's going on. That in no way legitimizes any valid claims of abuse that may or may not have occurred. But the fact that this exaggeration has had such a profound effect on our reputation means that it's an effective tool when it, when it works. Um, a second way in which I think uh, al-Qaeda, the enemy, has done this is through this principle of distinction. And whether you think they need to be in full-blown uniforms or just some other kind of distinctive insignia or way of, of identifying themselves, the bottom line is by blending in with the civilian population, it makes it very difficult for US soldiers and service members at the lowest levels to be able to identify who their enemy is. And, and if you can't do that, it is clear that there will be excessive civilian casualties. It's happened throughout history and it happens even today when, when we're faced with that situation. Um, and so by the failure to wear those uniforms and or other distinctive insignia, we end up probably having more civilian casualties than we would traditionally have. Um, and then a last point on that is that taken to the ultimate extreme, since it does obviously take away a tactical advantage of the United States, which may well be its military superiority, um, it can have an effect of lengthening certain conflicts. And so by doing that, you are unable to figure out who, who in this group of 30 people is actually your enemy and who are the innocent civilians that are living peacefully in that area. And we've had a very difficult time doing that. So I think that it has had an effect on this war, and I think that um, it is something to be concerned about. But through the panel, I think we can talk about ways to address it that may be acceptable you know, across the, the political spectrum. Can I respond to that? Uh, oh, you, go ahead. And on, uh, I guess, my two cents on my, my interpretation of lawfare in this context, it's not 
so much as people filing habeas claims and that kind of thing because that's expected. You, you expect people and their attorneys to act zealously for their clients. However, Walker, in my mind, is more of a cumulative approach to the legal system as a matter of practice as opposed to as a matter of merit. And a lot of that, for example, would be a, a lot of these uh, false um, detainee treatment claims where they're literally kind of grabbing from the headlines and using that as their claims. And since the burden's on the government to say, to prove the negative essentially, then it, it puts a, a disadvantage for the government. And so the, the equivalent of that, I guess, would be a frivolous lawsuit as opposed to you know, the uh, legitimate items that you think they're gonna, gonna levy. However, from a, a, a tactical lawfare standpoint, I would say that what happens is even besides the bigger scope of the courts, there's also the administrative level of levying everything as a matter of practice. Like we're gonna levy this, we're gonna levy this, we're gonna say this, claims and claims and claims, no matter what. It's, it's, that's because we're told to do that. That's our SOP, our standard operating procedure. Uh, for example, the Taliban, there's many, many reports, and, and before I was practicing law, I was in Iraq capturing a lot of these uh, top guys. And one thing we noticed is, is that they're always, not always, but many times, particularly the highly organized detainees, as soon as they're captured, and usually the first interrogation or the first medical check, I've been tortured. I, I've been tortured, and they start kind of running off. You know, they uh, stripped me naked, and they did all this kind of kind of thing. And here's what happens from that. It causes a... Uh, from a tactical standpoint, it paralyzes the investigation process. It takes troops and personnel away from the mission, and they ultimately have to do the investigation through the administrative procedures that are built into the system. Um, operational momentum, meaning that missions have to kind of slow down, and you can't just break up an insurgent or a terrorist cell right away because you have to deal with this immediate administrative issue of, um, of you know, the. Uh, of kind of the detainee claims and that kind of thing. And I think that's where lawfare actually really affects things. It's more on the ground in the tactical sense. Let me just jump in here quickly. So um, I guess I want to back up for a minute. I, I don't know if I'm the only one in the room who feels this way, but I think I'm still confused as to what exactly lawfare <laughs> means. And I think this panel already is revealing a little bit of that, that Sandy has one definition that I like very much, um, but I think the others of us might have a little bit different definition. And so. Um, I actually want to just back up for a minute. So this question is lawfare a concern in the war on terror. I think the answer is, well, it, again, it depends on what you mean by lawfare. And I think it's particularly important to, to figure out at, sort of a, in the first instance what we mean by that um, before we begin to discuss this question. And I've actually found that the, to me one of the most, um, uh, uh, one, one of the, the most instructive uh, moments in this conference was uh, Professor Werner's comments on this. And so I just want to back up and just, just, just talk about that for a minute. So he says, look, lawfare can mean a bunch of different things. It can mean uh, critical self-reflection, right, the sort of David Kennedy sense of this, you know, to capture the art of managing law and uh, war together. It can also mean, I think this is the way we're beginning to talk about it, lawfare as an instrument of war, right? So the notion that, you know, in this sort of asymmetric warfare, uh, that weaker groups use this against uh, strong nations like the United States. And then there's also this sort of reflexive law, uh, uh, lawfare. And I think, David, what you're going to call sort of counter lawfare, uh, the, you know, lawfare is sort of a pejorative label to discredit, as uh, Professor Renner said, it, an opponent's reliance on law and legal uh, procedure. And I think, you know, I, I appreciate Major General Dunlap's comments that he really meant this term to be ideologically neutral. And I think he was quite eloquent. Um, in his defense of that position. But I think we have to really recognize that, um, again, particularly in the war on terror context, boy, has it morphed since then. And I know earlier panels have talked about this, and I don't want to belabor this point too much, but uh, to say that this term has been hijacked in this context, I think, is to put it very mildly. Um, of course, that began with the Bush administration and the national security strategy linking judicial processes with terrorism. But since then, and again, I think it's important to recognize that this is not just a term that uh, academics toss around or that, uh, that folks in the military are, are, are sort of using, but that this has really sort of gotten out there into uh, the blogosphere and into the popular media. So for example, let me just, let me just uh, read this quickly. Uh, Andrew McCarthy wrote about that, wrote, was writing about uh, a Fourth Circuit case back in 2007 addressing the rights of enemy combatants in the Almari case. And here's what he said, quote, Strike another blow for lawfare. Okay, and here's his definition, right? And this is, you know, 
sounds plausible, I suppose. Strike another blow for law here. lawfare. What's that mean? The use of the American people's courts as a weapon against the American people in a war prosecuted by the president under an authorization for the use of military force overwhelmingly passed by the American people's representatives in Congress and all for the benefit of an alien sent here to attack us. And what's interesting, I don't know if anybody's read McCarthy's piece, but what's really fascinating to me about it and deeply troubling is that he seems to suggest that lawfare is not just being committed by the lawyers representing Almari and these other uh, detainees. He really suggests that this lawfare is being committed by Fourth Circuit judges, right? By, uh, by judges on US courts. And of course he points out, well, the two members of the court who ruled in favor of the detainees, they're Democratic appointees, right? That, I think, is really, really troubling, and I think to, to get at this question of how concerned should we be about lawfare in the war on terror, there's the question that Sandy's addressing, and I think that, um, uh, uh, that I'm sure we're, we're going to address at greater length. Uh, but I think there's also this question of just how broad and deep this sort of popular notion of lawfare uh, really goes, and I think it's quite broad and deep, and I think we need to take that very seriously. David, I know you want to jump in. Thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting. Sandy says that access to the courts is not lawfare. Michael says, you know, well, filing habeas corpus, Saul says that's not lawfare. That's what should be expected. But actually, if, if you look at uh, the response to the, primarily by the Bush administration, to uh, their concern over lawfare, their, their reaction or their reflex was to shut down the courts. I mean, you, you can you can argue, and I do in my article, which I well, encourage you to read, that, um, <laughs> that they developed a counter lawfare strategy, uh, even though it wasn't necessarily actual lawfare going on, but they believed that there was gonna be lawfare. So they said, well, we are going to prevent these people from ever seeing the inside of a courtroom, no access to lawyers, no access to courts. I mean, that is the most effective response to lawfare is just to completely silence uh, the enemy, you know, whether or not they've actually determined that they are enemies and even though many of them were innocent. Um, so to say, well, hey, just filing habeas corpus and access to courts, that's not lawfare. I mean, that is what the neocon version of lawfare is, is filing lawsuits on behalf of detainees and they are attacking detainee counsel and Scott Horton is, is right about that. Um, so I, I mean, I think reasonable people would say um, it's not lawfare to uh, try to determine if you're, you know, if someone really is a combatant and, and uh, you know, but we're not necessarily always dealing with reasonable people. Andrew McCarthy being, you know, uh, exhibit A, Mark T. <laughs> I could give you other examples, I mean, that are popular. I mean, and these are people that are writing in the, uh, uh, Mark Tiason in the Washington Post and then people in the, in the David Rivkin and in the Wall Street Journal using the same type of terminology. And so what happens uh, from this is that you end up demonizing lawyers. And we've heard a lot of very moving comments from people about the, you know, the need for lawyers to be courageous and the integrity of the law. Um, but there, there was a lot of demonization going on of lawyers who were just out there trying to, to do uh, their best um, to uphold the rule of law. And uh, I think it's a, important to, uh, to recognize that, that that's not lawfare, whatever lawfare may be. What if we, if we stick to, to some narrower definitions? So, so Michael gave the example of allegedly false claims of abuse and you know, things like in, in um, the Manchester Manual. I mean, that, that would seem to fit a very narrow definition of the use of, of law as a, a means of achieving an operational objective in a conflict. Uh, that is to say, you consume the enemy's resources by forcing them to engage in administrative process uh, instead of engaging in combat. And again, assuming that the, 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 the claims of, of the false claims of abuse are, are proper and if someone teaches administrative law, there's always a trade-off between more process and whatever the substantive goal one has is and presumably if you can force your opponent to engage in more process, then you can frustrate on the margin frustrate their ability to achieve their substantive goal. Is that the, is that is that a, a legitimate exa uh, uh, example of something we should call a lawfare and something that we should be concerned about? A absolutely, and I, I do cite that as one a legitimate example. The Manchester Manual that that uh, you know instructs 
members of al-Qaeda to, to make false assertions of torture. But the, interestingly enough, the, the, the administration used that to actually cover up real uh, torture because what they did is every time there was an assertion by a detainee of abuse or something leaked out from the Red Cross, they would say, well, you know, you can't really trust these people. Look at the Manchester Manual. It just tells them that they should make false allegations of torture. And for years, the, the American people were misled about uh, the, detain the, de the abuse that was really going on under cover of the... So that is a, a, a good example of counter lawfare, of, of using that to uh, obfuscate what, what was really going on. And, and you know, this idea of false, d that uh, the detainees are making false allegations of torture, and, and maybe that has happened, maybe my personally experienced that. What I experienced at Guantanamo is that every assertion that my client made uh, about being abused we were able to prove through the U.S. government's own documents if we were just able to get them turned over. For example, he was stripped naked, and I was provided the photographs of that, uh, this Mohammed Jawad I'm referring to. He was sleep deprived. They did the frequent flyer program, and it was all in U.S. government records. Uh, so, you know, uh, take with a grain of salt these uh, assertions that, oh, that, uh, it's, it's, it's a bunch of false, false claims of, of abuse. If I, could, if I could add in, I mean, I, again, I, nothing, nothing at all excuses any mistreatment of detainees, and I think that's been said by both administrations, and there has been different levels of accountability within the own military for that. But, but it is true <laughs> that there were some exaggerations and that the Manchester Manual, as you say, called upon uh, members of al-Qaeda to do this as a tactic. So it is a legitimate... Um, in a legitimate example of where lawfare was used. And, um, and it did have the tremendous effect of discrediting the United States military. So it was effective. And so by that nature, I think it is a classic example of where lawfare is being used. Um, to turn maybe to a different part of the process discussion, not necessarily the investigative part, but, but one other interesting aspect of this whole idea of distinction, this whole idea of not knowing who your enemy is, that has been challenging has been trying to identify them through regular process. I mean, you wouldn't probably know it uh, by what you read, but, but the detainees in Afghanistan, for example, have much more process than a prisoner of war would have under the traditional Geneva Conventions. And a lot of that has been developed to deal with this asymmetrical threat where you encounter five guys, you think one of them is your enemy, you think maybe two of them are, they all have the same story. They all say that they're you know, taxi drivers or cooks. They all look the same. And so you will necessarily detain the wrong person. Or if you over-detain, if you hold them all, then you'll have more than, than you should. And so it is difficult. We've developed a lot of board processes to try to make that easier and to try to weed out the individuals who are your true enemy. Um, it takes resources, and it's resources that we've gladly committed to the process and I think improved over time. Um, but this is one new way where the, the law is developing as a result of this tactic. And so now there is more process. And, and maybe a lot of people would argue that that's a very good thing. So I won't say that we won't willingly put people out there to do these missions because we think they're important. Um, but it is difficult to encounter as an 18-year-old, 19-year-old, 20-year-old when you're told to go get the enemy and you can't figure out who the enemy is. It, it's very difficult. Michael? I'll say on that line, when. Uh I was in Iraq, for example. Sometimes they would send us to a uh, to a village and say, "Okay, we're looking for Muhammad." And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, and we have Google Earth. Uh, you know, literally a picture of Google Earth, and that's what we're that's our intelligence. Um, but regarding more of the process and kind of to expand upon what David said and Sandy initially said in her last statement is that another game that's played, at least from from my experience and my research, is that. And first I'll say that, yes, definitely there's instances of mistreatment. I mean, what, I'm, what I said before, I'm not saying that, no, it never happened. Obviously, there's happened. I mean, you know, you've got Abu Zubaydah, you've got Khalid Sheikh Mohammed with the waterboarding, you've got Katani was one of the kind of high-profile cases down at Guantanamo Bay. But there, are, there is a game that's played where it's, there is the deliberate abuse of our legal and administrative policies. And, and uh, I'll give you an example. Um, there are very good defense attorneys and very good um, human rights people, but there are cases, including uh, with investigations, one guy was convicted from the government side, of actually smuggling 
through legal ma mail, which the government's not allowed to look at, smuggling this into Guantanamo Bay. And sometimes people laugh because then literally they'll smuggle in tidy whitey underwear or something like that. And it's funny until you realize that people can use the elastic of that to hang themselves from the detainees. And another final thing I'll mention on that, another game that's played is a lot of this, uh, the naked pictures and that kind of thing, sometimes it's, there are, the military is very good, the guards are very good at taking, and a lot of these are 19, 20 year old kids taking records of everything because that's what they're supposed to do. But the game that's played is taking these things out of context, these records. For example, there's an acronym called FCE, which is forced cell extraction. And that's what happens when a petulant or a detainee refuses to come out of, out of his cell. And what happens is the guards, they start to videotape it, they document it, and they literally have to remove the detainee from the cell. And it's uh, very organized, it's very stressful on the guards. But the truth is many times these FCEs are orchestrated and choreographed by the detainees themselves because they want it on the record. They're trying to get the photographic evidence of them being pulled out because all of a sudden then it's transferred from the guards are trying to take out this guy for whatever reason they need to leave their cell, maybe to clean it or whatever. Instead, it's these evil, evil 19, 20 year old guards are enjoying and abusing the detainee. And that's the taking out of context within the, the rules and policies that we have created, as, as the United States has created to, you know, to make sure that the, the bad stuff doesn't happen. I'm sorry, can I just jump in here? So, Michael, and is your claim that the fact that they are doing this uh, and we are having to address those sorts of problems, right? Is your claim that that's lawfare because it's consuming our resources that we could otherwise be spending on fighting terrorists? Or is it your claim that that's lawfare because it is, in terms of public opinion, that it's harming you know, that, that, that Americans are looking at that and saying, my God, look at the way these, these poor detainees are being mistreated. That's a great question. There's two photographic caches that I think are probably the biggest problem in this, this decade. One of them obviously is Abu Ghraib. The other one is that 2002 photo at uh, Camp X-Ray at Guantanamo Bay where the, uh, everyone, I'm sure everyone's seen it, where they're in the orange jumpsuits, the detainees, and they're kind of crouched down. Um, and those, that photograph has done more, particularly in, in the wake of Abu Ghraib, to make the, the U, anything that happens at Gitmo is automatically suspect and you know detainee treatment is automatically the benefit of the doubt. So the public perception part of it certainly is true. I think a lot of people don't realize that that orange jumpsuit thing only, Sandy I'm sure can say, but and this is, it was only there for a couple of months until they built the, the physical place. Now I know David's gonna jump in and say, well, there's more stuff that went on, I get that. No, that's not what I'm going to jump in and say. What, what I'm going to jump in and say <laughs> and I <am> too. <laughs> is that it's not lawfare. Because, exactly. because that was a picture that was taken at the time of what the conditions were like. It was authorized by the Department of Defense to allow that. It was the United States' own stupidity, incredible stupidity, to, when new facilities, improved facilities, were built to bar uh, any journalists from going to take pictures and from publicizing this is what conditions are at Guantanamo now a after they were improved. And it took years before they ever let anyone take a picture out of some, you know, f phony security uh, worries. Uh, so, um, but that's not lawfare because it, it wasn't, it wasn't detainees doing it, it wasn't Al-Qaeda doing it. I mean, who, who were putting those pictures out there? Well, here's the thing. The second part of what I was going to say is to answer the other part of Melissa's question is that that's the benefit of the doubt part. The benefit of the doubt is on behalf of the detainees and their advocates and the government. As you, and the government has done a number of <laughs> weird things. Um, and, and so they've, you know, they've the, worst, the government's its own worst enemy. Maybe. But what happens is, so the benefit of the doubt for the government is lost. And then, next thing happens is what I was talking about before, the cumulative claims elsewhere. And it's all cumulative, and again, it's, it's practice, it's a matter of practice and not based on the merits. In many cases, not all the cases, some are legitimate. So what happens is, again, it goes back around the loop to the tactical element, where it goes down where the benefit of the doubt is always against the government, and it again affects back to, for example, Afghanistan, or in the, in the battlefield, where the battlefield's being shaped, and it goes back to you know, re draining resources, financial, investigative resources, intelligence agencies have to change their tactics. The government, instead of, um, you know, capturing for intelligence purposes, are now opting for targeted killings via drones or whatever because it's easier. 
then capturing and having to deal with detainee treatment. And it's a kind of a cycle, which I think is based off of these claims. And that, I think, is a real issue. So, so, I, so I think, and, and there was a, an article that I'm sure most of you read in the Washington Post recently that addressed this very issue. So is it the case that Obama's uh, attempt to respond to, uh, well, a attempt to address the closing of Guantanamo and what do we do with military commissions and his attempt to respond to the critics of the Bush administration's approach and, and, and to his own approach. Is it the case that he has sort of said, oh my God, I, I don't know what, when, whenever we detain somebody, we don't know what to do with them. It's a big mess. The courts get involved. It's habeas. There's lawfare exploding everywhere. And instead, let's go with targeted, kill, targeted killing, right? Because if I take them out, then we don't have to worry. That, I think, is a real issue, right? That, that's a real issue. Is this sort of explosion of lawfare actually in this one context, right, the treatment of detainees, uh, and the explosion of lawfare before the courts, right? But that's, that's a separate issue. Uh, and a different definition of lawfare. Is that actually leading to, uh, leading the administration to adopt a technique which is, which is, for which the administration is arguably, well, not arguably, is less accountable, right, presumably? That's a really important issue, but I think we have to be careful when we're when we're when we're, when we're talking about what's what sorts of acts by let's say detainees count as lawfare or don't count as lawfare. So the first example that you gave, Michael, was uh, well when we you know we've got somebody down at uh, Guantanamo or wherever we're detaining them, right? And we want to bring for, what do you call it? Forced extraction, FC forced from extraction cell. from their cell, and they're sort of making a big stink and that sort of thing. If your contention is that, well, that's lawfare because we have to expend a lot of resources dealing with that that we otherwise wouldn't have because otherwise the American people are going to, you know, look poorly on us, there's two problems with that. Number one, I don't think the average American knows about that, right? Forced extraction, who knows about that sort of thing, right? It's all right? secret. It's all secret, right? I mean, you know, I, this is the first time I've heard about this problem, right? That's number one. It's and number two, are, are, are we it's honestly right. contending here that the American public is so concerned about the rights of detainees, right? And that, you know, we're, gosh, we've really got to give these, you know, these potential, you know, these, these alleged terrorists, you know, their, their Miranda, you know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, are we really contending that we're so concerned about that? That I mean, is that really slowing down the, our efforts in the war on terror? I'm just not sure I buy that. Well, I think a lot of it too is, I mean, you, you're gathering evidence so that you can, in the Manchester Manual, take it for the value that it's worth. When you gather this evidence, you're, basically creating a cache of evidence to use in your litigation. Prevent, for example, maybe it's your habeas case, maybe it's your criminal trial, whether it's in the military commissions or it's in you know, federal court, whatever it's gonna be. But a lot of this is, I think, um, kind of an evidentiary gathering aspect on the, on, the, on the behalf of the detainees to kind of build their case. And if you read the Manchester Manual, it actually says that much, say, you know, get the names of the guards, get the names of everybody, Get as much information as you can, and then when you go in front of the prosecutor or the judge, let them have it. And do we really, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do we really have so, so and this has been an issue that, that I've sort of thought about over the course of the day. Do we really have so little faith in our judicial system, um, or wh whoever is adjudicating these issues, that we can't trust them to weed out, so you mentioned early on uh, in your, uh, your opening comments, well, there are frivolous lawsuits and there are legitimate lawsuits, for example, right? Uh, and the frivolous ones, that's when lawfare is happening and we ought to do something about it, and then there are the legitimate ones. Well, isn't it up to the judiciary to sort that out? And can we really not trust the judiciary to, to, to do that for us? I think it's more when it's an organized uh, cumulative <coughs> attack where it's, I think it's more than just saying, you know, one person saying, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to claim this or that, but I think it's more of when you're, it's a cumulative effort as a whole and not so much as by the individual where it's an overall tactic saying we're going to, you know, because remember in the context of, we talked about the, the media perception and that kind of thing already, so, and that certainly does play a role in it, but when you get to the point of, you know, it's always, it's lawsuit A, lawsuit B, lawsuit D, lawsuit Z, all saying essentially the same thing, and then the benefit of the doubt from the government's already gone. And then again, it comes back down to the lower levels where the tactical, the, and the actual, the battlefield, and that's where you see, you know, again, it goes to the changing of the battlefield tactics, where, um, for example, when, again, I keep, hate to keep reverting back to my personal experience, but in Iraq, there was an evolution where originally we would just catch people, and, you know, we would grab them, 
you know, take them to the, the base and maybe interrogate it and move on to whatever detention they were going to do or released or whatever's going to happen. But it changes, and this is a way actually how we fight back in a way, is we started documenting everything for evidentiary reasons. We start, and, and this is kind of a the way perhaps there's a solution to kind of whittle some of this down is we took digital camera photos of everything. We marked everything. We documented everything that we got from, you know, from a detainee and that kind of thing. And I think that's, that was kind of, I think, our initial response, at least in the 2006 time frame, to kind of, kind of fix some of this mess. And, and it is a mess that we're in. Let me, let me add in one point there, because I, I think that this is where it kind of brings it back into the mainstream conversation, which, which is, I mean, we have adapted tactics, but that, ex but, but that sort of points out to the fact that they used a tactic Absolutely. with the law that put us at a disadvantage. And so we have developed tactics to do that. I mean, the original perception was in the middle of a gunfight, who's going to stop and take witness statements? Ha-ha, the U.S. military can do it. You know, I mean, we've learned how to try to do the best we can. I'm not going to say that you don't get read your Miranda rights and you don't have a police officer with you, but you do have some basic fact-finding process that tries to go on to the best of the ability and consistent with the safety of our troops, which is a, con a considerable concern. And so there will be times when it's done well, and there'll be times when it's done poorly. And so, you know, the only point I'd make from that is that, you know, the tactics are evolving, and this is how the law has been used in, in several ways. And, and, and I think we've come back to find ways to deal with that challenge, and rather effectively in some cases. But it does ultimately, um, hurt us sometimes in our defenses in an actual court of law. Because the reality is the, the, the United States government evidence that was, kept, that was taken at a scene in 2002 may or may not be the quality that you're looking for. And so while I don't personally consider the use of the courts in any way to be this lawfare, I'm thinking of the battlefield tactics, um, we end up coming up short in court many times as a result of at least our initial procedures back in the earlier days. And I would say our processes are much, air, much more airtight now that when we capture someone, we have more information to, to try to determine who they are versus what we had back in the initial days before we'd adapted our own tactics a little bit. So some of that you've seen play out in the various degrees of information that's been presented in court. One thing I'd like to, to We've been talking a lot about the actions of the detainees, but I'm curious what the panelists think about the actions and perhaps the obligations of attorneys involved in this, in the sense that you know, to what extent do attorneys, uh, for example, those uh, defending uh, detainees, have an obligation to uh, consider either the implications of the arguments they make uh, or, or the actions taken on behalf of their clients or uh, their uh, clients' aims? Yeah, in pursuing uh, certain litigation or raising certain sorts of claims. Is that, is that something that we should expect of, of defense attorneys in this context? Or, is, or is, is the client's will just simply what one should follow? Is, is the standard any different in this sort of context than, say, in, in a traditional litigation context? Well, I have some views on that. Um, you know, and I did think about whether any of my actions were, you know, unintentionally harming, uh, you know, U.S. military or military interests abroad or things like that. But first of all, you have to consider the fact that Congress passed the Military Commissions Act, which mandated that detainees charged by the, before the military commissions would have a military defense lawyer. And I was ordered by the president, I mean, that's what the orders say anyway, you know, him, him personally, but I was ordered to go and do this. Um, and, and the oath that we take when we uh, become officers, and the same oath that the president takes, is to defend the Constitution of the United States. And I did not see any conflict at all uh, in defending a detainee and, and my role in defending the Constitution of the United States, if, if you, you know, just as defending any other criminal defendant. Um, but um, but then I, you know, I did have a choice and I, uh, in another area, and I chose to file a habeas corpus petition or, uh, on behalf of one of my clients, Muhammad Jawad. Uh, my other client, uh, Mr. Al-Balul, had, had a habeas corpus petition and, and ordered that it be, um, be withdrawn because he did not, did not want to be released. But, uh, um, you know, I'm, 
member of the United States military, I'm in uniform, I am suing the U.S. government, which normally we are prohibited from doing, and in this case I did not ask uh, for permission, uh, <laughs> but rather uh, asked for forgiveness um, uh, after the fact. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, General Dunlap was saying that, that he had some good advice, which is not to sign up for, for your own Google alert with your name in it, but, but, <laughs> But I did. I like to hear my press coverage and, uh, or read about it. Um, but one thing that came up all the time is my comments from the press, and I was quoted a lot by the Xinhua uh, news agency, I guess the Chinese news agency. I was quoted a lot in Al Jazeera and other uh, in Yemen. I was very popular. Uh, so, uh, you know, and a lot of times I couldn't even read it exactly what it was, but, you know, my name was there. and I, and. I um, and it might have been as an long error. as they spelled it right, it's okay. Yeah, right? right. Yeah, I wrote nasty letters to the editor of Al Jazeera, um, but um, but I did wonder sometimes, you know, what am I, you know, what exactly is this? This does seem to be giving some, you know, aid and comfort to the enemy in terms of embarrassing the U.S. And but you know, we it was stuff that we deserved to be embarrassed for that we just it was shameful. So. I didn't, I didn't lose a lot of sleep over it. So would you say there are any limits on zealous advocacy in this context that might be greater than another context? And to give one example that, that um, and then I'm gonna uh, uh, turn to, to Mike and Sandy on this too, because the prosecution's uh, conduct might have also been a question. There was an example of, a, of I guess it was an Australian uh, military uh, officer who was a defense attorney for, I guess it was David Hicks, who went back to Australia, made a lot of public comments about the trial that, uh, that uh, then were challenged by uh, uh, Colonel Morris Davis as being inappropriate because rather than simply seeking legal process for, for his, the charge was, uh, for his client, he was seeking to essentially win his client's release uh, through the political process. Right. And, and Colonel Davis suggested that, that were a, 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 a JAG who was out, acting as a defense attorney to act similarly, uh, that that would have been inappropriate conduct. Uh, was, was Colonel Davis correct, or, or was Colonel Davis uh, uh, perhaps um, uh, entering into Cully Stimson territory of, mm -hmm. of, de of un unfairly demonizing uh, lawyers for, for the identities of their clients? Well, it's funny. I think you're talk referring to, to Major Maury, who is a U U.S. Uh, uh, military JAG officer, and, and, and I, I think Colonel Morris Davis uh, who's a friend of mine might take a slightly different position now because he's become a very outspoken critic of the of the military commissions. But um, we recognized uh, that the f the battle was going to be won in the court of public opinion. That that we couldn't just confine our actions to the military commissions, which we considered to be uh, an unfair, illegitimate kangaroo court. So why why are you just going to focus in there, your client is just going to go down in flames. Uh, we wanted to try to bring about, you know, th there needed to be political changes, there needed to be legislative changes. We, what we observed, when I say we, I'm talking about defense attorneys in the Office of Military Commission's defense, is that countries that put a lot of pressure to get their detainees back were getting people released without trial. Um, so there was uh, efforts on the diplomatic front, um, you know, that, that you really, we're doing your client a disservice if you just focused on the military commission where you were, you know, probably going to lose, uh, although I didn't, I didn't lose, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, um, you know, that was the, the mindset that was that these cases were unwinnable, that the system was set up uh, to convict your client regardless of, of you know, the merits or whatever. So, so we really had to go outside the box, outside what, what you would normally do if you were defending a, a service member before a court martial where you had a high degree of confidence in the, in the fairness of the process. And, and what about the, the comments by, by government officials and, and prosecutors challenging uh, defense attorneys and their conduct? Is that, is that those sorts of things legitimate complaints about uh, the practices or tactics of, of defense attorneys or, or uh, is it uh, unfair and perhaps even unethical demonization of attorneys for, due to the identities of their clients? Well, first I'll say that, uh, that my friend David Frack did a masterful job <laughs> with his case. And I'm, I, I mean that in all sincerity. Um, and I'm a, I've always been a defense counsel myself up to this. So I have a, a high degree of respect for defense counsels that, and 
the ability to speak publicly and act and do almost whatever is possible in order to protect your clients. And these clients are in a precarious, or in a, particularly Guantanamo Bay, but even you know elsewhere in situations where you're dealing with detention like that. These people are in precarious situations. They need someone like David Frack. They need someone who is a complete pain in the butt, <laughs> who is, and I mean that respectfully, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as in my own defense experience, I'm always, I am the pain in the butt as well in that. And, but I speak out. I, you know, you do whatever you can. I think that you need that. However, there is a line, and the line is drawn when you start breaking rules. And and this is I think and this is most prosecutors. I know I for one, you know, we want the best defense attorney possible. You want someone that will really push all the buttons. And you know, you, sometimes you roll your eyes at some of the motions and things like that. But you're you want that because you want as fair as a you know, transparent as possible, at least from, you know, my perception of this, but the line is drawn when they start breaking the rules, when people start, for example, there was a, a government attorney, um, he was convicted down at Guantanamo Bay, he was sneaking out uh, secret information via Valentine's Day cards and sending it to uh, some of the human rights groups, things like that. That's crossing the line. That, Of course, he wasn't a defense attorney, but if there are defense attorneys who are breaking the rules, even if they're stupid rules, you know, you know, there's, as a lawyer, you're supposed to fight those rules through legal means. You're not supposed to smuggle stuff through your attorney-client mail and that kind of thing. That's where I think where I draw the line is from being the zealous advocate to more unethical activity. And what about the, the, the question of, of uh, should attorneys be worried about the practical consequences of pursuing certain arguments, perhaps seeking the release of certain information in the context of a trial? I know there's a uh, a significant state secrets decision just this week from the Ninth Circuit. Certainly some would argue that, uh, and Andrew McCarthy, who was mentioned before, would certainly argue uh, that the release of certain types of information in the context of a trial it couldn't be of such significance uh, from a national security perspective uh, that um, to, to push for that in the context of a, of a, of a court case is to really compromise uh, the nation's national security interests. And he bases that concern, I believe, in part on his experience with the first World Trade Center trials where it turns out some of the information that came out in the process of that trial uh, was advantageous uh, uh, to terrorist organizations um, uh, that learned a lot more about uh, the way the United States monitored and, and tried to keep tabs on terrorist groups. If you're talking about from the standpoint of the defense attorneys, then I would say, you know what, have at it. Defense attorney, that's their job, is to push the buttons, try to get all this stuff out there. You know what, it makes the prosecution's job a lot harder when the defense is trying to get after a lot of this you know, this classified information, and you know what? That's, the game, that's part of the theoretical system of how it's supposed to work. And I, I have no problem with that, personally. And then is it okay for the prosecution to go to the press and say, gosh, we should, we should look at where these attorneys practice, we should look at who their clients are, um, make sure they know where their money's going? Up a great question, I'll say this, is that um, ABA, you know, the kind of the ethical rules say that when you're dealing with a case, you can talk about the facts of your case, and you can't go in any more of that, at least from the government side. And I think that, I mean, that would be unethical, I would think, to, like, if I went there and started trashing David Frack for being treason or something like that, that's on me. That's unethical on me if he was in the opposing counsel, and I would never do that. And I would, I would hope that uh, no prosecution, at least that I work with, are violating the ethical rules of that. Yeah, let, let me just add in to make sure that it's, I think, clear across the board that under no circumstances is it acceptable to attack the, the integrity of a defense counsel who's representing their I mean, that's what the process is supposed to do. There were unfortunate remarks made. I don't need to get into the name of who. You've already made it. But, um, but you know, they've been disavowed in certain circumstances, in every circumstance. I mean, he resigned. He left his job. Um, there has never been an official policy that I am in any way, shape, or form aware of that demonizes the, the defense attorneys for doing their jobs. I mean, that's what they're supposed to do. The court system, you know, as Melissa commented earlier, I mean, the court system should be able to meet out, you know, that the, the, the beauty of our system of law is that both positions are supposed to argue their way out, and the truth and the law should come out through the judges and through the system. And so um, both prosecution should be able to zealously argue, and the government should argue its case, and it does, and not everyone likes what the government argues, but the government argues its case. Defense should be able to argue its case. And, and the way that it works out is what becomes the law. And if you look at our system of law, I mean, you know, it, it, some people would criticize this, but the reality is, I mean, we had an enemy combatant 
during wartime, sue the Secretary of Defense and win. I mean, that is not something that most not countries have. Thing. And so Absolutely. people use it as an example of how you know horrible the government was, but the reality is it's a tribute to the system we have. And it's the systems and the institutions that are durable. And Defense Council doing their job as part of our durable system. And so is the prosecution and the government doing their job as part of our system. And so, you know, in the in this whole idea of trying to depoliticize some of it, if we want this term lawfare to have teeth and to be able to sort of, you know, move forward in a way that's helpful to defining the laws of war, then I think we have to try to depoliticize it where we can. Yeah, and let me just jump in just for, I, I'm sure there are folks in the audience who are actually maybe not familiar with what we're talking about. What Jonathan's referring to is a man named Cully Stimson, who was, uh, uh, he was the, uh, at the time I think he was deputy. Her job. <laughs> I'm sorry? Did the same job as Sandy. Yeah, he had your job right before you. Is that right, Sandy? <laughs> you, 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 you followed on his heels, right? So, so now, now everyone knows why I didn't want to say his name. So, yes, yeah, so, so you, will, you will all have newfound respect for Sandy when you learned the job that she inherited. So uh, Stimson, here's what he said on a, um, on, on a radio uh, uh, talk show. Uh, he said, uh, let me see here, let me find it. Um, he said, oh, you know, I've, I've been looking into uh, the folks who are, the names of the folks who are going down there to defend these, uh, uh, these Gitmo detainees, and it's shocking what you discover, and here's what he said. Um, he said, I think quite honestly when corporate CEOs see that those firms, and by the way, these were the, I mean, you know, the fanciest firms in the country, uh, really, really uh, fancy firms, the kinds of firms that all of our students want to work for. Uh, I think when corporate CEOs see that those firms are representing the very terrorists who hit their bottom line back in 2001, those CEOs are going to make those law firms choose between representing terrorists or representing reputable firms. I think this is going to have major play in the next few weeks, and we want to watch that play out. And I think to its credit, the Pentagon immediately came out, pretty immediately, I think, and distanced itself from these comments, as did everyone else. I don't think there was really a lot of questions at that. But let me just say this, I, you know, bravo for the Pentagon for doing that, but let's also keep in mind that, so, so one question is to what, extent, to what extent was Stimson sort of, you know, going off the ranch with this comment. You can make that claim, certainly. Um, you can also say that the Bush administration started the ball rolling by in the national security strategy document linking, explicitly linking judicial processes with terrorism and saying this is a threat to us, lawfare is a threat to us. So one can argue that Stimson was simply taking his, uh, 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 taking his strategy from that playbook and that, that he took it to an extreme, right, and was sort of, uh, um, uh, and, and, and got kicked to the curb. But I don't think he was totally coming out of left field and doing that. No, and I, I don't think he was coming out of left field either. I mean, the comment was out of left field, but it was very consistent with the, with the views of senior administrators within DOD and, and, and uh, the White House. Now, in Cully's defense, he's a former Navy JAG, and he deeply, deeply regretted that comment, uh, not only because it lost him his job, but I think he didn't, <laughs> didn't really mean it. And, and, and he has, uh, you know, it was interesting when the, uh, Liz Cheney group uh, came out with the, um, you know, who are the Al Qaeda Seven and the Department of Jihad and it, uh, advertisements that were, you know, really over the top. Cully Simpson was one of the, the first to jump out and 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 come to the defense of the Gitmo Bar, and he signed the letter that that the uh, was released by the Brookings Institution and other. You know, a lot of other conservative uh, lawyers signed saying, "No, the, this is out of bounds. You know, these people are, are playing a, an important, integral role in our system, and we may disagree. Whatever." Well, what my argument is that many of those lawyers, those conservative uh, lawyers, many of whom had been in the um, the Bush administration, failed to acknowledge that these type of comments are a natural extension of lawfare. Uh, I mean. It, or what I call counter lawfare, the the demonization of you know the delegitimization of the lawyers of the messenger, um, you know, uh, if you can't win in court, you know you can at least um, try to win in the court of public opinion or or, or uh, challenge the loyalty of uh, of these people and discredit them, um, and and so that. And there was a lot of that going on. Uh, maybe calling people Al Qaeda Seven uh, was was 
taking it a little bit far, but that was, it was insinuated or implicated that, that lawyers for the Center for Constitutional Rights, you know, that they really were more sympathetic to the terrorists uh, and that their claims of, of, of you know, just trying to um, defend the rule of law and, and provide fairness and due process and openness and transparency, that's not really what they were about. They really were about undermining, you know, America's security. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a slippery slope we go, we go down and... Um, but, but just to put you on the spot, I mean, didn't a minute ago you say that, that when you're representing your client before military commission, if you can't win in court, you should try and win in the court of public opinion? I mean, is, 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 is it, is, is, should it be asymmetrical? I mean, perhaps maybe it should, but if, if it's perfectly acceptable for uh, defense attorneys to, uh, who disagree with or think the rules are unfair or think at least the very least that their client can't win under those rules, to instead pr to proceed uh, to, to engage the court of public opinion, would it also be acceptable for someone who perhaps believes, as you know, uh, close to half of the Supreme Court justices, uh, current Supreme Court justices do, that these issues shouldn't be in court at all, to also uh, take the case to the court of a public public opinion, and and at least we're talking about American public opinion, not international public opinion. In, in some of these cases, they they might win. I mean, Boumediene did did invalidate a law that was passed by uh, pretty overwhelmingly by Congress and, and signed into law by, by a president uh, and, and was the sort of rebuke of the political branches that historically we had never seen uh, in, a, in a wartime context before, uh, whether it was good or right or wrong. I mean, and shouldn't the government attorneys or those seeking to defend national security employ the same sorts of tactics if, if, if the legal rules aren't on their side? Well, I mean, one difference is that as a defense counsel, you have a client who has clear interest, and in, and that when you are a representative of the United States government, I think you you have a, a, a different obligation um, to be to be to the truth and to fairness and and uh, not to distort things. Um, but if you buy into the idea that we're you know it's all part of the war. Uh, and there is a war on terrorism, and these are all terrorists. I mean, that's another thing I wanted to address, is that we keep saying that there's an assumption that detainee lawyers are ter representing terrorists, but actually the vast majority of people at Guantanamo were proven not to be terrorists, so uh, they actually were representing innocent people for the most part. And, we, and, and Mike talked about the, you know, the government doesn't get the benefit of the doubt, but as uh, was pointed out, I think, by... Um, one of our speakers earlier, uh, maybe it was Michael Sharp, uh, three out of four detainees who have gone, a actually gone to the merits on their habeas corpus have won. The government could not prove by a preponderance of the evidence um, that, you know, that there was a lawful basis to hold these people. And this is after they had won in a combatant status review tribunal where the government did have the benefit of the doubt under the, under the rules. Um, so... I'm not sure if I answered your question. I know Melissa wants to jump yeah, in. Yeah, I really want to get in on that. I think, Jonathan, I think that's a fascinating question. I think that's a fascinating question. So is it, is it legitimate for, um, even for government actors, if they truly believe that this is, that this, the, this sort of lawfare, right, by defense counsel and by detainees is so dangerous um, that, that sort of all bets are off in terms of their own strategy. Um, I think the problem with it is that the victim is, the is Americans respect for the for the rule of law and for the legal system in general right and I think that's why for example the American Bar Association was one of the first organizations you know not known for being I don't think particularly I don't think of it as a particularly lefty organization <laughs> certainly doesn't engage in a whole lot of lawfare that I that I know of uh, but it was very quick to jump on this and say as has everyone on this panel I think and I think all of us all the folks sitting over there would as well I don't know that this is a hugely in fact Sandy and I were talking about this at lunch do you think anybody's going to defend Colley Stimson well, obviously not, right? And I think the reason for that is that there, there, there must be limits. Um, there must be limits to what the government can, to what is legitimate counter lawfare, right? And de so delegitimizing Al Qaeda and saying, my God, did you know Al Qaeda published this manual where they're actually, you know, they're actually telling people, you know, cook up these, uh, these, uh, you know, these torture allegations. Well, sure, that's legitimate delegitimizing the lawyers and the judges, the Fourth Circuit judges, you know, not a particularly liberal court, again, right, uh, for, for doing their jobs, that I think is incredibly dangerous and incredibly corrosive to our respect for the rule of law in this country. Um, just to push on the point a little more, I mean, I think two things. One, I think one of the things that Stimson's comments 
were, that made them so inflammatory was the suggestion not simply that people were going to be subject to criticism, but that they would lose clients, potentially lose their jobs, which whatever one's view of, of anything else he said right. is, is um, extreme in the sense that, that if the government would try and use its power to, to, def to defund um, uh, 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 attorneys in that regard. But doesn't it necessarily assume that, that these are questions that courts have business in it all, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm pretty certain if 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 one of the folks who organized the, the the Lawfare Project conference were here, one of the things they would say is that is that the whole problem is that this is not uh, uh, the job of judges. And and to, to somewhat paraphrase uh, Justice Robert Jackson's dissent in Korematsu, I mean, Justice Jackson says, look, of course, the court can't uphold these detentions, but he also says that. It's, it's not clear this, that it's the sort of thing that should be in, in courts at all, and that the, the ultimate measure of military conduct is not its constitutionality, but its effectiveness, which is also more or less what Abraham Lincoln said when he, when he defended his, his suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. Right? It's, it's not a question of the courts doing it wrong, it's just that maybe this isn't their place. Maybe, as the Wall Street Journal editorialized last week, a federal court shouldn't decide whether or not drones are an acceptable way to engage in, in counterterrorism. Maybe that's something that we have to decide as citizens uh, through the political process. Um, and, and if that's one's view, why shouldn't you criticize judges that, that don't find ways to, to abstain from deciding the case or find ways to, to, to decline their own jurisdiction? Why shouldn't you criticize attorneys that are trying to bring the courts into, not, not threaten them, obviously, but criticize them for dragging the judicial uh, system into things that, that aren't its proper province. Anyone want to take that up? I, I'm just, I'm just going to sort of wrap that one up by saying it's, I think there is a distinction between who is doing the saying and the government really, I mean, I get back to the point, the government should not be attacking in any way, shape, or form our system of justice or rule of law. It's a fundamental part of our Constitution. It is what we take our oaths to uphold. And so um, even if, you know, does that mean that people out in the blogosphere can't take these positions? That, that's fine, I think. But, but you're not going to hear the government doing that. And they can make their positions in their briefs, and that's where, you know, it's appropriate for them to raise the government's view. But to go out and attack judges afterwards, it just wouldn't make it. And I, I just wouldn't expect you would see a government do that. Certainly not ours. So we wouldn't see a president criticize the Supreme Court in the State of the Union address, <laughs> in the State of the Union address with them sitting in the audience. <laughs> Again, you're not going to generally see government. No, I, I, you know, I just don't think we've seen much of it. And, and you'll, you'll occasionally hear someone, they can disagree. You disagree with a, a judge's opinion. I, I think we've heard that happen before. But but to the extent of actually criticizing, saying the kind of comments that she was reading earlier, you're just not, it, it's just not what the government generally will do. Yeah, and just, I mean, just a brief sort of two finger, I guess, in response, Jonathan. You know, for anyone who thinks that judges are sort of, you know, these activist judges are running amok, you know, <coughs> desperately trying to take up these cases, you know, sort of at the drop of a hat, um, I, I don't know. I, I think in my study of, of, of sort of the relevant precedents and, and, and and sort of courts' approach to national security issues in general, they really are not very fond of these kinds of cases, and there are all sorts of doctrines that they employ, standing, political question doctrine, the state secrets privilege that Jonathan mentioned, to avoid getting themselves embroiled in these sorts of disputes. And I think we're, so we're seeing a lot of, you know, so Hamdi and Boumediene, and we're seeing a lot of these cases which may make, a, make us think, right, oh my God, look at these activist judges going crazy. But in fact, they are really, I think, the exception rather than the norm. And so that, I think, too, is why I'm not, uh, there, there's, it doesn't completely answer your, address your question, right? Well, should they be there in the first place? And I guess to that, my response would be, well, I don't know, maybe not, but let's also not think that they've only been there over the last 10 years. There is lots and lots of precedent for, for engagement in these sorts of issues, right? Certainly not, not in, in not so closely supervising detainee affairs, but, um, but they've been there for a long time. David, did you want in on this one? I'll pass. Okay. <laughs> um, well, one issue we still haven't, we have only a little bit of time left, but one issue we, we haven't gotten in, into is, is to, to kind of look at this beyond just the U.S. context. And, and you know, one of the things that's been talked about is, is the way that raising legal claims can affect the conduct of military operations um, by imposing administrative burdens or perhaps causing um, military officers to behave differently than they would. Um, 
To what extent in, in thinking about lawfare and the war on terror should we be thinking about things like uh, the increase in universal jurisdiction or the potential for US actions to be uh, 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 raised or scrutinized by, say, the International Criminal Court or, or uh, other international entities. I, if I recall correctly, last year at this time, uh, at, at the time of this conference, um, there had just been, uh, within a week of the conference, some news stories about uh, investigations of the use of predator drones uh, by the U.S. and whether or not they violated international law. Should, should, is the calculus any different? Is the way we should evaluate uh, legal claims in, in this context different if we're looking not just domestically but internationally? Well, I personally think we should embrace uh, international review of our actions. You know, when I came into the Air Force, and I believe it still is DOD policy, although it changed for a while, the policy was that the, the United States Department of Defense will comply with the law of armed conflict uh, at all times uh, in, in our, all of our actions, however a conflict might be characterized. And we, we train our, our personnel to comply and we uh, act, our policy was, you know, if, if there was a violation uh, of the law of armed conflict by any side, then, the, then we would uh, report that and aggressively investigate it. And if we actually stayed true to, to that, uh, we, we really would not have anything to fear. I'm not one of these people that really buys into the whole politically motivated prosecution, we ought to fear universal <coughs> jurisdiction. I think we should embrace the ICC and, and these other, uh, and, and uh, you know, and just it, the people that are worried are the people that were violating the law. That, that's why they're worried. Uh, that's why they don't like universal jurisdiction, because they're war criminals, and they know it. Uh, I, I, I just think it's that simple. I, I do not, I never, you know, heard anyone who, uh, you know, criticizing it or being worried about it that, um, that you know, always complied, you know, com comported themselves, you know, completely properly and, and, and was somehow worried that, you know, that there would be some basis that somebody would find, some phonied up basis to, to, to prosecute them. Uh, I, have, I just have more confidence in, in the international legal regime than, than obviously the neocons do. I would say that um, I think that, you know, with the universal jurisdiction power, you mentioned the drones, you know, and I, I think, um, I guess my fear would be that it would be, we'd almost have to have a, more of a balancing act between a bureaucratic military and uh, real kind of on the ground considerations if the U.S. was subject to kind of more like the ICC or something like that. I mean, because one person's war criminal is another person's hero. I mean, look how many people have accused George W. Bush of being a war criminal or, um, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu or, you know, Ehud Barak or something like that over in Israel. Obviously, you know, I think that's kind of the inherent issues with the U.S. and Israel, that thing. But if you look at, um, for example, I'll get to a, a question of the law of war, the law of armed co conflict for a second. This is an example. The, the drone issue, where a lot of people in the world are starting to say, oh, that's a war crime. You know, there's lawsuits in the U.S. There's a lot of kind of rumbling outside the U.S. When I was in Iraq, I, um, I flew what's called a, mi I operated what's called a micro UAV. It's basically a model airplane with fiber optic um, cameras and uh, a little laptop and a joystick. And I would sit, you know, right by the wire and I would basically, and no weapon, it wasn't arms, and I would follow the road. This was a very brief time when I was in Iraq before I started going on more missions. And I'd follow the roads and if, we, if I saw somebody who stopped on the road to lay an IED under the ROE, which is the acronym for Rules of Engagement, then I could theoretically call soldiers and they would be okay to capture or kill the person who was, who was laying, the, laying the roadside bomb. So now you have an arm. So what's the difference between surveying somebody with a kind of just a very basic drone and then using that as a basis for a soldier to go you know, kill somebody? And then you have an armed predator to do the same thing based on the rules of engagement. And then you go to universal jurisdiction. And I'm not saying that it's, you know, giving it a uh, thumbs up or thumbs down in my personal opinion on, on uh, kind of getting into that arena. But I do think that that's the real world issues that I think people need to consider when you're talking about that because, again, one person's war criminals and another person's rules of engagement. And I would really hate to see a situation where the operator of that, of that drone 
that fired on someone that he was authorized to target because they were violating the rule, part of the rules of engagement would be considered a war criminal. I mean, I think that's different than what Dave is talking about where you have kind of like the Charles Taylor or something like a very obvious point of view. One is even, even uh, the, the sense that, that the United States assessment of what the legality of the use of predator drones, not simply in, in maybe Afghanistan or Iraq, but in Pakistan and Yemen and wherever, um, is different from certainly the assessment of many academics and per perhaps also different than the assessment of, of authorities in other countries. And so, I mean, in, in that kind of context, isn't it not yeah. a question of, well, they're guilty and they know it, but the United States has what I, I believe the Obama administration has a good faith belief that their use of predator drones is consistent with the law of armed conflict. I'm certainly aware of many people who have a sincere belief that the Obama administration is wrong. Uh, is that something that, that we should just happily turn over to whichever legal authority ends up taking up the case? Yeah, and so just to provide some context for folks in the audience who aren't as familiar with this. So the notion is that, so universal jurisdiction basically permits a court in another country to, take, to, to uh, prosecute, so for example, someone for the United States for abuses of international law. Um, and so the question is, is, is this something we should worry about in this context? Well, first of all, I, I think, I have to disagree with David that, that I do worry about politically motivated prosecutions in, in the universal jurisdiction context, just as I think that politically motivated prosecutions happen in our country. I, I, I can certainly, it's certainly plausible to me that they would happen in other countries as well. And of course, Jonathan's point is really the, 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 the really salient one here, that this is not a black and white issue necessarily. This, you know, lawfare and, and the, 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 the the art of managing law plus war, uh, it's a developing field. It's a rapidly developing field. So you could certainly see where we're going to come to one determination on the, le the legality under international law of targeted killing and that uh, the Europeans might come to another conclusion. So I think it is something to be, uh, to be concerned about. Here's another concern, I think, about uh, if, if we were to see a lot of universal jurisdiction, a lot of movement toward uh, prosecutions under universal jurisdiction, and this gets back to, I think it was General Dunlap who, who raised the tipping point issue, right? Do we reach a point where there's just so much of this kind of stuff that either the, the U.S. government gets sick of it, or again, out in the blogosphere, and I do worry about the blog, I, I think the blogosphere speaks for, you know, it speaks for and shapes American public opinion. Do we reach a point where uh, it's not just neocons saying, look at what these crazy, uh, the legal left, as they call them, are doing, but suddenly it's the American people as a whole saying, look at what these, cr this crazy Spanish court is doing, this crazy Belgian court, that sort of thing. I will say, though, that I think our experience with universal jurisdiction shows that I think it's actually pretty good at at taking care of these sorts of issues itself. So some of the, the universal jurisdiction prosecutions in Belgium, so, so for example, uh, against Henry Kissinger, that sort of thing, uh, the Belgian government very quickly realized, oh, this is really not good for us diplomatically because the United States government really, really hates this. And they revised, I think actually abolished at the time, I don't know what's happened since then, their universal jurisdiction law. So it's a concern, but I think it's one that I suspect just ordinary international diplomacy can probably take care of. And when I was referring primarily to the International Criminal Court, I mean, it, I think it could be problematic if every country in the world has their own uh, universal jurisdiction law and just let and lets any ordinary citizen, you know, initiate a criminal complaint. But I think there's sufficient safeguards at the ICC and along with the complementarity that that where there, you know, you there is a good faith basis, uh, and we're talking about. I, I just think the ICC is focused on the type of thing that we heard from the the good justice from Uganda of, of very large scale atrocities, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity uh, by the, the, you know, and not individual isolated uh, acts that, that may be questionable. Uh, so I, I'm just a little, you know, more trusting that, that uh, this, the seasoned pr professionals who work there and, and the way the, the appointment is, are structured that, uh, and, the, and you have to go to the pretrial chamber to get, you have to get permission to investigate, you have to get permission to proceed. It, it has sufficient safeguards that, that the U.S. really need not be worried about phony, malicious uh, prosecutions. But, 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 you're not, but you're differentiating that from universal jurisdiction in, say, Belgium, Spain, or wherever over something like use of predator drones? Well, the way it was, uh, the way it was set up in Belgium where, where anyone could walk in and initiate a complaint, I think uh, that opens the door for, for politically motivated. I mean, you, I think you have to have 
uh, prosecutorial independence with a, a, a judiciary, uh, judicial oversight, and, and you know you can you can construct it in a way. I mean, it is important to uh, to not have Im impunity, and so I I think we the the U.S. is supportive of that that idea. We were instrumental in, in the early rounds of, of developing the ICC or the Rome Statute, and and we ducked out. I think in part uh, because of uh, irrational fears of lawfare uh, and that and but they may not have been the only other explanation other than irrational fear is that they were rational fears because people were committing war crimes rational fears of the ICC because we're committing war crimes or, or? Uh, again I mean I, I this has gone sort of all over the place this particular question so just I mean a couple points I would make is on on universal jurisdiction, we, we have not really seen a trend yet that is alarming in this in this vein. I mean, where most of our service members are, we negotiate status of forces agreements to ensure that the United States has a primary right of jurisdiction. And we work it out in most cases with those countries how we will handle criminal action if they want to bring a charge. And so as a practical matter, we don't have large numbers of service members being you know, charged flying through Paris or Belgium going on leave somewhere for operating a drone. So as of now, this is not really a concern that we're, that I think that we're really facing. So um, obviously, if that were to start happening in large scale, then the answer might change. But, but for now, I just don't see that dynamic really there enough to say that it's, it's a significant threat at this point. But, but Congress did authorize their armed forces to invade the Hague to uh, capture any <laughs> American service members who are uh, brought to custody before the ICC. So, you know, we do have a, that option, the military option. <laughs> I, I, I may be a representative of the government speaking in my own personal capacity, but I have not been a member of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> I think General Dunlap wants to ask a question. Where's, go for it. Dave, I think you misspoke when you said that people who have a differing view of the International Criminal Court are war criminals. Because that's the kind of the demonization of people who happen to have a different perspective for very good reasons uh, that we don't want to get into. So I, I think you misspoke when you said that. And Michael, I think you misspoke when you said, or seemed to suggest, that somehow uh, a, a remotely piloted vehicle strike would be made because, my gosh, it might, if we captured the guy, it might lead to some complicated litigation because in 34 years of the military, I've never met an intelligence officer who much rather want to capture, capture somebody. And I have never personally can imagine a military lawyer or government lawyer signing off on, you know, let's just kill the guy because to avoid litigation. And I don't think we should let people think that that's the way the process works. I mean, there, and the problem, of course, with the remotely pilot vehicles is we can't get people to really look at the technology. Everybody's thinking it's like a new thing to, oh my gosh, there must be something wrong if somebody kills somebody from afar as if they've never read the David and Goliath. And, and <laughs> you know, uh, haven't you seen the Band of Brothers, Agincourt? You know, what's the English? <laughs> Bowman do to the French knighthood? And what did happen at the Battle of 73 Easting in the first Gulf War? The Iraqis had tanks that shot 1,500 meters. We and the British had tanks that were shooting 2,100 meters. And so we were killing people who really basically didn't have the chance to. That's not to say that I think that there should be more visibility on the legal process, but what Philip Alston talks about where he wants all these operational details. It, to me, it demonstrates a little bit of naivete in that the enemy is going to go to school on those operational details. And then one last thing, I'm really going to shut up. <laughs> I think Jonathan raised an extremely important issue of the ethical limits of zealous representation. And I think I heard it said that, well, there's nothing wrong with a uniformed military officer. Uh, well, let me put a hypothetical. Would it be in the name of zealous representation? Is it within our code of ethics for a uniform military officer to say, you know, if I go out and campaign for the opponent of the current camp commander chief in uniform, using my military status, because after all, if he's defeated in the, the election, 
that'll be a good thing for my client. And if that is not what we want in a democracy to do, is that what we want our uniformed military to be doing? And if the answer to that is no, then is it okay if they go to a foreign country? Because once we get into that, using uniformed military officers to project a particular point of view uh, in the name of zealous representations, is that the path that we want to go down as a democracy? And I'm going to ask each of our panelists if they can respond to this very quickly because I'm under very strict instructions from, from Michael that uh, I'm supposed to, be at, to end at 4.50, and it looks that that's what the clock says. So. All right, well, I, I, I do have a tendency to uh, use some hyperbolic language, so I, I appreciate general restraining me. Uh, yes, I did not need, mean to imply that all people who uh, oppose the U.S. entering the ICC are war criminals. I do think that, that uh, some of the senior leaders uh, in the prior administration uh, were concerned that although they probably could avoid prosecution for the things that they were doing here in the U.S. that uh, foreign courts might not be uh, as sympathetic to their claims of good faith reliance on legal memos and so forth. So they, they had that in mind when uh, they made the decision to withdraw from uh, our signature. Um, but uh, on the zealous advocacy point, um, I, I agree with Michael Leibowitz that you, know, you, you still have to comply with the law, you have to comply with professional, uh, you know, guidelines, the rules for professional responsibility, um, and, and you certainly shouldn't promise your, your client otherwise, or, and, and it's perfectly appropriate to discipline those who, uh, who exceed those, those boundaries. I think we're going to have uh, to end it there, but uh, please join me in, in thanking our panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, for the last 10 minutes of uh, the session, we are very fortunate to have the director of the university's Inamori Center for Excellence International, International Center. Center for, uh, okay, you got it. Um, Shannon French, who has been uh, taking all of this in, and she is a real master of sort of summarizing things and finding the, the seeds of what we should have as our takeaway. So without further ado, I turn it over to you. I should say, stop, stop, don't sell it like that. <laughs> I can't. Um, you know, I, I first I just want to say, I, I realize everyone has done this, but uh, at the beginning, Michael said that we were, you know, going to have a wrestling match here. And I, I think it's been an outstanding wrestling match. And so I applaud everyone who's been involved, and especially, of course, Michael and his entire team for putting this on for us. So thank you. Now, Michael also made perhaps the mistake at the beginning of saying that there were four questions we were going to address, which of course sets me up to do this, which is to restate those questions and see where we are with them. Uh, those four questions, if you, if you don't recall, were what is lawfare? Is lawfare a useful okay. concept? Are there legitimate and illegitimate types of lawfare? And how should we respond to lawfare? Now, I could just be flip and say that the answers to those four questions are, it's not clear, we're not sure, maybe, and we don't know. <laughs> but uh, that might imply that we did not accomplish anything here, and that is certainly not true. As a philosopher who uh, works in the field of military ethics, I for one learned a great deal, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. So let me try to summarize some of the things that I learned, some of the highlights uh, and insights that were shared with us throughout the day uh, very, very briefly, and then let you all go. <laughs> we learned that the term lawfare was introduced to describe the use of law as a substitute for, a continuation of, or a resolution of traditional warfare. We might call this the original definition of the term. However, as many of our speakers noted, this term has more recently been adopted or hijacked, depending on your perspective, as a way to pass harshly negative judgment on the use of law by the weaker party in an asymmetric conflict against their stronger opponent for political ends. Uh, 
And those who use the term pejoratively in this way see this as an effort, paradoxically, to use legal means to undermine legal norms. So these two different understandings of the term lawfare produced two separate threads of discussion that ran throughout our proceedings. On the one hand, we heard from those using the original definition of lawfare uh, about the best ways to use legal means to uh, find an alternative to war, and also as a way to try to construct a legitimate and lasting peace. This encompassed everything from going after the finances of terrorists to stabilizing peace agreements to prosecuting war criminals. We were told that powerful nations should not be afraid of being challenged or sued. We were warned that gains made on the battlefield in blood can be lost in the fine print of ink. It was suggested that we are much better off using law than bullets. And we were enlightened, and I think all of us were moved, to hear about the challenges of endeavoring to forge a just peace and the essential and positive role that law can play in that process in partnership with efforts for restorative justice. On the other hand, among those assigning only negative connotations to the term lawfare, we heard the concern raised that if law can be used, and especially international law, by those with purely political motives and no sincere respect for the laws that they appeal to, hard-fought gains in international law could be lost and norms could indeed be eroded. We also heard the warning that such practices could place commanders in the field in unfair and untenable positions. So what can we conclude from all this? I can only give my perspective, and I'm sure each of you has your own conclusions or conclusions in progress, as we, we most of us have. But I come away from this very stimulating conversation feeling that while there are very real and important harms that can result from the abuse of the law by those with no genuine commitment to justice, the greater risk by far would be to limit access to legal redress. Perhaps just as our commitment to free speech requires us to put up with awful things like crazy pastors threatening to burn the Koran, our commitment to justice, to the temple of justice, requires us to potentially put up with some offensive uses and abuses of the law. Not that we should not resist those, but we may have to endure them for the greater good. And the bottom line for me, as someone who has lost close friends in combat, is that I have to agree with the Lila's comment that the rush to court is a whole lot better than the rush to war. Thank you. Please join the uh, speakers for um, a, pres a uh, reception in the rotunda. And did you have something to say about that? Well, the, the only thing I wanted to yeah. say is um, there's some things on the table out there. Uh, those of you who uh, are interested in these topics, which is obviously all of you, um, we are having another event here at Case Western in late October, the 2010 International Peace and War Summit, which uh, um, Michael's organization is a co-sponsor of and, and my center is hosting. We will be bringing in uh, scholars from 15 countries to examine peace and war. And topics include uh, such questions as ethics of war in the 21st century, law, policy, and practice, the causes of conflict, challenges to a sustainable peace, uh, and so forth. So if you are interested in this, I urge you to uh, investigate that as well, and those events are also free. So thank you. <laughs>